Hi, and welcome to the Core Finance Master Investor Show. My name is James Faulkner. I'm the editor of Master Investor Magazine. I'm joined by Jerb Curtis, who's the manager of City of London Investment Trust. Hi, Jerb. Hello. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, the City of London Trust um, is focused at income investors primarily, UK equity investors. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the, the trust parameter, investment parameters and objectives? Yes, we're in the UK equity income sector, so we're invested at least 80% in the UK stock market. We're predominantly in the large cap stocks and the FTSE 100 stocks, so we do have mid cap as well, and we have a small amount overseas. We provide an above average yield compared with the UK equity market. We've got a very long record of growing our dividend every year. Okay. So the yield at the moment is around just over 4%, I think? It's around 4%, yes. Yeah. And the yield on the FTSE is somewhere around 3.8 or something like that? 3.6, 3. yes. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, what, what do you look for in a good dividend uh, stock? What are the, what are the well, uh, traits that you look for? What we're looking for is a mixture of income and growth. I mean, income on its own is not enough. I mean, yeah. a bit like life, companies are either going forwards or backwards. <laughs> and, uh, and so the company needs to be generating enough cash in order to both pay the dividend and also to invest enough for the, for the future yeah. um, and the future growth of their profits and business. So we're looking, um, you know, we, we look into a lot of detail into the sort of cash characteristics of the mm. business we're investing. I mean, certain types of biz industries don't need less investment than others and are able to sort of have a higher payout ratio yeah. and they may have more modest growth prospects. So the portfolio is a kind of blend of... Um, of companies, and I have got some lower yielders in the portfolio to provide, you know, more more growth. And so, in the very long run, uh, we have actually outperformed the index quite quite um, by quite a degree. So, um, so it's in fact, in a way, dividends are the secret um, part of investing. In that, um, actually, a lot of the long term return does yeah. come from income. There are periods when growth is very much in vogue, but in, in the long run, dividends are very important. And going forward, I suppose, with rates being so low, I suppose the, the dividend income is going to be a greater component of returns going forward, I suppose? Well, rates have been very low f for a while. Um, as, as we know, they were cut down to 0.5% during the financial crisis, at the end, towards the end of the financial crisis in, in 2009, and um, have stayed very low ever since. Um, so um, in actual fact, I mean, obviously it means that an equity income trust such as ourselves is popular because mm. it's very hard to find that type of yield that we're providing around 4%. Um, in, you, know, you can't find it in bank deposit accounts yeah. and, and very hard in fixed interest. So, um, and we're providing income growth as well. But, um, but having said that, um, it's actually been a good period for growth stock investing in recent years. I mean, the world markets have really been led by the so-called FANG stocks in America, the Facebooks, Apples, Alphabets, etc. So, um, so, so I wouldn't say that this is necessarily p purely a, a good era for income investing it's been a good era overall for stock markets yeah and the trust itself has got a, a really impressive record of dividend growth i think it's is it 52 years of uh yes. annual increases yes. in dividend payment yes. now yeah and you yourself have been there for around 27 years is it? yeah just past my 27 so wh yes. what's what's your secret to uh, to dividend success <laughs> well i think you've got to be in the right companies uh, base you know the companies that are provided well placed to provide consistent mm. dividend growth and um, uh, and you know that that obviously requires work and analysis and judgment uh, but also the investment trust structure does have certain advantages in that unlike open ended funds we don't have to fully distribute all our income every year so yeah. we can hold back up to 15% so it means you build up a revenue reserve and so in the years where there are dividend cuts across the market mm. then you um, can use that reserve to carry on growing the dividend so actually this out of the 27 years I've been manager, seven years we've had to dig into reserves. So I couldn't have achieved the record um, and the trust wouldn't have achieved the record if, if we'd been open-ended. It, it just wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. And there's a lot of debate surrounding the, you know, the OIC versus the um, trust uh, structure. Um, what else is it about the investment trust structure that enables superior performance, do you think, over the long term? Well, I think it's horses for courses. And, you know, you know some people... Um, will prefer open-ended, but uh, certainly one aspect that investor trusts can do is they can use a gearing, which is um, borrowings. And um, yeah. so this wouldn't, it's not to everyone's taste, we do it in a conservative way, but certainly in a rising market that will enhance returns. Right. And then investor trusts also have independent boards of directors, which um, who provide an extra level of kind of scrutiny and that they're there to, um, uh, to, to act in shareholders' interests and to, so they're, they're there to negotiate fees. There are, some investor trusts have higher fees than OICs, but in mm -hmm. general, Trusts have investors have lower fees, and um, our trust has, you know, our fee is 
particularly low at um, our, our on-game charges ratio last year was 0.42, which is right. much it's lower than you find yeah. in, in the night. Um, what about Brexit? Because um, obviously the situation at the moment is you know, utterly confusing. Nobody really knows what's going on. How is that impacting um, investors such as yourself at the moment? Well, I think it is a very difficult situation to read, and it ch changes, um, uh, you know, quite a lot. Um, so, but I think the important thing to remember is you're investing in companies, and certainly um, the UK stock market over seventy percent of the profits come from overseas. So mm -hmm. that gives you a sort of insulation, um, really, from from looking at narrowly from a UK perspective. But you know, the markets kind of react, and you know. To some extent, the UK has been shunned a bit, um, both um, by domestic investors and um, and global investors. And so that does, you know, if you take a relatively sanguine view, that mm. may be throwing up quite a lot of value, actually, in some yeah. of the domestic sectors. So I, I think it would be a mistake to ignore uh, some of the domestic sectors, um, you know, particularly if we get a favourable outcome. You know, there could be a lot of opportunity there. But yeah. certainly in the city of London, we're mainly in the large companies. So we're kind of predominantly in large international companies. But we do have... You know our fair share of domestic companies like house builders, which where I'm quite also quite keen on prospects. Yeah, and while while we're on the subject of value, um, a lot of people have been you know um, looking at the U.S. markets in particular and thinking they look quite toppy at the moment. Um, the U.K. market looks quite a lot cheaper. Um, what's your what's your view on valuations in a sort of long term uh, perspective at the moment? Well, I think the U.K. market um, you know does look good value relative on its sort of trailing measures we look at like dividend yields or, or PE ratios. I mean, some people try and do it on a cyclically adjusted basis, um, which, um, you know, but again, it doesn't look bad value compared to some of the other markets. I mean, the US has got this big technology sector, which has really um, caught the imagination mm. of people. And certainly, um, you know, the companies there are doing remarkable things. And, and you know, they are, but they have very high valuations, some of them, like, like Amazon, you know, but mm. people are willing to sort of, because they're growing their revenues so rapidly, willing to kind of um, put them on a, on a very high valuation. Um, so we, and we don't really have a big technology sector in, in the yeah. UK. So it's not completely sh comparing apples with apples. But um, the market certainly looks good value relative to fixed interest. Um, the yield on the market we were discussing 3.6%. I mean, 10-year gilts yielding about 1.3%. So it's, um, mm. you know, it's, and you've got mid-single-digit mid dividend growth. So I, I think the UK market does look, look reasonable value at the moment. Um, uh, but we've had a long bull market. You know, the market's been going up, you know, best part of nine years. Yeah. And, uh, and so obviously people are, people do get a bit anxious. But um, certainly um, on the measures I look at it, and, you know, companies seem in good shape. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, um, uh, pretty happy with it myself. Yeah. Um, and which sectors in particular and which companies in particular are you finding value in at the moment? What are you buying and selling? Well, I was going to suggest um, <laughs> a, a, an idea um, which, will, which kind of works quite a good pair, as you might put it. Right. Um, and that is, yeah. um, I mean, I quite like the old sector at the moment. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, Shell and BP are very big companies. Royal Dutch Shell and BP. Um, Both had quite a good run. They've had a good run. Um, and, you know, but people were worrying a year or so ago where they'd have to cut their dividends. And now they've actually covered their dividends for free cash. They've reduced their costs dramatically. And... And of course, the oil price has moved up quite sharply over yeah. the last year, and as um, and obviously, you know, supply global growth has, has boosted demand for oil, and um, supply is getting, beginning to be constrained, particularly when you throw in renewed sanctions on Iran. So, um, so the oil the oil mates are in a good place, and they're both yielding over five percent at the moment. Mm. So, um, so I think um, I think you know they're not these are very big companies, and you know they're, they're not going to kind of dram dramatically perform like a a small cap stock might, but but I think they look pretty solid at the moment. Um, yeah. And then I want the one I wanted to sort of kind of uh, connect with them or combine with them um, was actually Carnival, uh, which is um, right. uh, which is the biggest cruise company in the world, and it's basically eighty percent listed in the US as a dual listed stock, and twenty percent listed in in the UK. And it's actually, um, I mean, one, of, I mean, cruising is actually um, quite a good growth area in people. It's it's a relatively good value holiday re compared with equivalents um, mm. on land, and it appeals to sort of the older part of the population where yeah. and benefits from good demographics. But Carnival quite cleverly got lots of different brands in their uh, companies, so they have got brands that are or kind of cruise companies that appeal to the younger generation as well. So, um, but I think 
why the shares haven't performed at all well over the last year or so, and that's because obviously fuel is a big component of costs for for, for all the ships, and so the market tends to um, uh, mark them down when the oil price yeah. is going up. So. Um, whilst in actual fact they, they've delivered quite well on their profits, they haven't actually missed in terms of their profit forecasts. Um, and so they, they're, produ they're coming, producing some steady growth. And, but I think it is a sort of stock, if, I, you know, if I'm actually wrong on what I was saying earlier, that your price does actually have a setback, then Carnival will hedge, certainly yeah. be, it's, it's a hedge <laughs> exactly um, against, uh, so it'd be a good, good combination to have either Shell or BP and, and Carnival as a, as a combination, okay. I think. Um, and what about the interest rate environment? Because interest rates, a lot of people see them rising, you know, in the near term. How does that impact you as an income investor? Are you worried about that? Well, I think you have to take a step back and obviously they would cut from 0.5 down to 0.25 after the referendum. Mm. And then that's been reversed. So we're back at 0.5. And people, I mean, Bank of England sort of blows hot and cold a bit, but, but it looks as though we might be on for another 25 basis points. Um, Right, so they go to 0.75. Well, that is still nothing compared to mm. what you're getting in the stock market at 3.6 percent, or in the City of London at four. You know, this is I don't think. Um, uh, and uh, you know, the the banks in England sort of agonising over whether to increase it from 0.5 to 0.75. So I think the kind of interest rates that I was used to when I was growing up, you know, <laughs> seem a long way away. And um, and there's certainly arguments there's so much more debt around, um, and also deflationary forces like Amazon and, and mm. internet retail generally. Um, and general capacity in, in manufactured goods, but it's, you know, we are in a much lower interest rate environment than yeah. we have been so in the past. So you think the, the long-term interest rate could actually now be lower than it, had, than it has been in the past? Oh, I think that's what every, all the indications yeah. are. I mean, you wouldn't have 30-year gilt yields at 1.72 or whatever they are today um, if that was not definitely the belief in, in markets. Mm. But um, certainly it's a slightly different picture in America where um, the Federal Reserve has been increasing their interest rates more rapidly and, and as a result, 10 year yields, you know, are, are much higher than, than they are in the UK. So, mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, I think, I think personally, the interest rates we've now got in the UK are abnormally low. And I think what the US is doing is, is good. I think that they're kind of normalizing interest rates, but I think we are in a much lower inflation era than we were, you know, back in the 1970s or 80s. So, so I think, you know, you would expect interest rates to be lower than they were then, but I would, ex I would expect them to see see them markedly higher than they are now right. over, over the next few years. Okay. Jeff Curtis, thanks very much. Thank you. Don't forget you can read the entire magazine for free at masterinvestor.co.uk. Thanks for watching.